here to share more books with you, uh, more books about American folklore and doing uh, research, trying to find more resources for North American folk magic. Um, originally, I was going to try to run through just an enormous list of books. I don't think that's going to work. I think that this would wind up being uh, insanely long, and I don't really want to do it that way. Uh, so uh, what happened was, as I was trying to figure out what books do I recommend for North American folk magic, uh, I started sort of seeing like, well, there's some categories that I could do so I could look at, you know, just the sort of uh, southern mountain regions and, and focus on books that address the folk magic there. Uh, I could uh, break it up into uh, specific traditions of magic, uh, focus really specifically, for example, on curanderismo uh, or something like that. And kind of talk about the books that I think are valuable in those uh, those areas to kind of study and learn about those traditions, uh, particularly from a sort of um, just educating yourself and having uh, the ability to kind of understand these traditions a little bit better. Um, so there was a lot of different ways I could do this. What I kind of sort of settled on was um, uh, an all slash none of the above approach, which is basically going to be I want to I want to look at um, just kind of little batches of books that have been really, really influential for me in terms of um, doing research on folk magic and understanding folk magic a little bit better, um, just in general. Uh, and so sometimes they'll be all sort of related together topically. Uh, sometimes they will be uh, just the ones that had so, sort of a, a, a converging influence on me in one way or another. Um, but whatever the case, I'm hoping that sort of, by, sort of by highlighting some of these different texts, these different books, it will um, help point you towards some resources you might find valuable. So what I'm really going to do is I'm just going to present a couple of these books um, each time I do one of these videos. Uh, and I'm going to run you through sort of what what is in the book. Why is the book valuable? What makes the book so useful to me? Um, why do I think it's it's in, important? Uh, and also kind of talk about, you know, what about the author's credentials, for example? Why, you know, is the author a, a reputable source? Um what uh, what are kind of the big topics that are covered within the book as well. Uh, and then if there's any, you know, critiques that I might have for the book too, because uh, one thing you find when you're doing research is that no source is perfect. Um, you may think that you have one of the best sources uh, out there, uh, and it might be very, very good. But in the end, it's it's going to be limited because it was, it was written by a human. Uh, every book uh, is going to have its limitations. Um, even mine, yes. Uh, so every book has uh, these these things that either because it's a product of its time or because it's uh, dealing with material that's going to be ever-changing. Uh, whatever the case, um, these kinds of books very seldom can lock something down forever and be perfect, um, but they can often at least give us some good information, um, good jumping off points to do more research. Today, uh, I'm going to be presenting um, a little batch of books. So these are books that are going to have something to do with the sort of historical presence of folk magic in North America. Um, it's not a comprehensive list. There's lots of books I could choose. I could I could pull a lot more out of here. Um, but I'm just going to kind of give you some some highlights. I'm going to start uh, with, uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit and do two books at once here. Um, because, uh, because both of these books are by the same author. Uh, and they both have some real relevance. Uh, within, uh, within sort of the study of folk magic uh, and uh, and witchcraft in North America, uh, and that is going to be uh, two books by Owen Davies. Uh, I've got America Bewitched, uh, the story of witchcraft after Salem, which is pretty valuable, uh, and then uh, Davies' Grimoires: A History of Magic Books. Now. Um, I'll start with Grimoires, uh, which I believe was written first. Uh, these are both published within the last 15 or so years. Uh, this one, uh, Grimoires, uh, came out in 2009. Um, so still relatively recent, still relatively current. You know, if you're thinking about history books, uh, books that are written in the last 10 to 15 years tend to be pretty uh, current on events. Um, not always, but uh, this one this one tends to, it's dealing with things that are a little bit older, so it can kind of get away with, uh, with that. Um, Davies himself, uh, Owen Davies, is a professor of history over in uh, the United Kingdom. Um, I'm not, I can't remember exactly which university he's with, uh, I believe, let's see, it may actually tell me here on the dust jacket, uh, Hertfordshire. He's the univers uh, professor of social history at University of Hertfordshire, um, or Hertfordshire, I'm sorry, uh, over in the UK. 
Uh, so Davies uh, is a historian by trade. He has specialized in doing a lot of uh, social histories of things having to do with witchcraft and magic. Um, if you've read his popular magic, that very much focuses on um, the UK. Um, it's, it's an excellent book. It's much more um, traditionally academic, that one is. The thing I like about both America Bewitched and Grimoires is that they're not specifically academic um, oriented. Not, not that they're non-academic, but they are um, they're geared towards a general audience in some ways too, while not dumbing down any of the sort of academic quality of the research. Uh, so he walks a really, really fine um, tightrope to bring this information to you, um, and I think he does a very good job with that. The main topics kind kind of covered in Grimoires uh, are uh, magical books, uh, and so he gets into kind of the history of a few different magical texts. Uh, he gets into, for example, the Clavicula Salmonalis, or the Key of Solomon, um, the Goetia. Uh, he gets into uh, he gets into a few of the other grimoires. I believe he talks about the Black Pullet, uh, the Serpent Rouge, uh, a whole slew of them. Um, many of these are very much centered kind of in Europe, um, the Mediterranean, North Africa, uh, in terms of their initial publication, but what's really, really valuable about this is that he follows the trajectory of these magical books um, from their initial locations, sometimes in the ancient world, sometimes in the medieval world, sometimes in um, a much more sort of contemporary world, and he follows them uh, where they go. So you wind up seeing books like um, the sixth and seventh books of Moses, um, which are, you know, considered kind of a grimoire text uh, that you sort of see uh, in a few different places, but he follows them. They, they wind up in North America and be, being, being very, very influential in North America uh, in terms of the folk magical practices over here. So um, so this winds up being a really, really good way of sort of tracking the literary uh, written history uh, of, of magical uh, practice in North America if you're kind of looking at some of the sort of European roots of certain practices. Some of the books he tracks down here, I believe there's one that's called The Golden Book, uh, which very much has some influence, I believe, on the Germanic uh, folks, which becomes a very, very uh, sort of influential thing uh, when you get to, for example, Pennsylvania German practices as well. So there's some really, really good information in uh, Grimoires. The other book that he has is uh, this book, America Bewitched, Witchcraft After Salem. Um, this one is much more, uh, obviously, much more focused on North America. It's much more um, directed towards somebody who's interested in the history of witchcraft in North America, crucially, uh, as it says, it's not, it's not about the Salem witch trials, which get all of the uh, attention, um, get a lot of the press uh, when it comes to North American witchcraft in Salem. But this, uh, this is Davies kind of saying, look, uh, witchcraft didn't go away just because the Salem trials ended. Um, the fears of witchcraft were still very present and very real. Um, importantly, a lot of things were going on around Salem as well. Uh, there are plenty of witch trials that occur in the, you know, 100, 150 years leading up to Salem. Um, and then beyond that, there's also a number of trials um, about uh, witchcraft that occur well after uh, the the issues in Salem. So he tracks, for example, there's one witch trial that happens in Pennsylvania, um, where I believe they're, I believe they're Scandinavian, they're Scandinavian immigrants um, who get accused of witchcraft. It's a mother and a daughter or a, or, or, or a woman and her sister, I can't remember which, um, but um, she didn't speak uh, English particularly well, uh, and so uh, so she didn't have a really strong ability to defend herself in court. But William Penn uh, winds up uh, hearing the case and basically says um, that she's guilty of having a, a witch's reputation, but that's about it. Uh, and so he just sort of says, you know, you know, be, be better behaved, <laughs> essentially, um, and uh, and kind of illustrates sort of the the Quaker mentality towards some of this stuff. Um, uh, as it sort of happened in Pennsylvania. But then you also kind of flash forward in time to, for example, in the early 1900s, you have uh, the, the Rehmeyer uh, case, the Nelson Rehmeyer case, where um, a man was attacked and uh, killed uh, for possessing certain magical books, which is where grimoires would also be a uh, kind of good companion for this. No shortage of uh, fascinating uh, research. Uh, again, a very accessible book as well. Kind of within that same uh, framework, another book that I highly recommend is David Hall's Worlds of Wonder, Days of Judgment. Um, this is much more of a historical book, uh, much more sort of what you consider sort of an actual uh, history book. It's still not necessarily the densest of academic texts, what people would think of as academic in tone than Davies' books. And that doesn't make it better or worse in any way, shape, or form. Um, both are very, very valuable books. Uh, Hall is 
uh, or was, I believe, I don't believe he's still teaching anymore. He may actually have passed away. Um, but he was a professor of uh, American religious history um, at Harvard Divinity, Divinity School. So, uh, so good credentials here. Um, this book is a, a good bit older. Uh, so I will say that some of the information in it might be something that you would want to um, double check sort of, you know, has there been updated research on some of these, these materials as well. This is published in 1989. So it is uh, what, 30, 30, a little over 30 years old at this point. So it's a little older uh, in terms of the, the, the book itself. The content is really, really interesting because he's really looking at the spiritual worldview um, of the sort of early colonial period of North America. Now, that's relevant because, um, for example, there's a lot of discussion about with the, the witch trials and things like that, where people sort of say like, oh, it's the, you know, the Putnam's uh, sort of asserting their political dominance in Salem versus uh, versus other families that are kind of in the area or something like that. Um, and they're sort of you know, making arguments about uh, the witchcraft trials having nothing to do with um, beliefs or, be or spiritual beliefs or anything like that. And what Hall, uh, Hall's not necessarily setting out to disprove that, but what he does is he looks at historical records, things like uh, court records, arrest records, um, church parish records, uh, a number of different, um, very detailed sort of archival records, um, including some of the books that are published. For example, Cotton Mather's books are very, very important to his research. Um, and he sort of opens all those up and, and looks at, well, what was really going on? So for example, you have somebody like Dorcas Hoare, um, uh, H-O-A-R, by the way, uh, Dorcas Hoare, uh, who is um, accused of witchcraft during the Salem trials. But what Paul points out is um, that, you know, if people want to argue there weren't people practicing witchcraft in Salem, um, Dorcas Hoare is a really interesting example because she uh, was arrested uh, in the decade previous to the Salem witch trials uh, for practicing fortune telling. I mean, she had fortune telling materials in her home. Um, she definitely seems to have been practicing that. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean she's practicing witchcraft uh, in, in quotation marks, right? And certainly not the kind of like religious uh, witchcraft that that um, people would sort of look at today. A very, very different kind of a thing. Um, uh, and also, you know, the, the, we're not talking about, you know, satanic witchcraft either. Like she's literally sort of reading, not reading tarot cards, but doing something similar to that, uh, doing fortune telling. Um, to, to bring in a little extra income because she's in this sort of marginalized position and she, she wants to be able to make some money so that she can, you know, have food. Uh, and so he does some really, really good kind of unpacking of that and saying like, look, this is, um, there's, there's more to all this. The people really did have these beliefs and really did um, practice some of these things. People were doing folk magical work um, all throughout the, the sort of uh, New England area and, and well beyond that. He goes into other sort of colonial areas too, but um, New England's kind of his focus here. So uh, so you, that's, uh, that's something that you can kind of get into and really see um, that there is folk magical practice uh, going on uh, even from sort of the early colonial, colonial period. And he is really good at kind of, kind of pointing out what some of those practices are, uh, which makes that pretty valuable uh, if you're kind of researching uh, early North American uh, folk magical practices, uh, particularly kind of in that sort of colonial uh, era. All right, so the next book I'm going to recommend, I actually don't have a physical copy of this book. This is a book that I have as a Kindle book, uh, so I'm just going to have to kind of show you the, the cover on my phone here. Uh, this is Alison Gaines' Witchcraft in Early North, North America. It is a, um, it is a, a book uh, that kind of addresses uh, North American folk magic, or I'm sorry, North American witchcraft history, um, from a, a bigger perspective than Hall's. So Hall's very much focused on kind of that New England colonial era uh, area. Uh, and Games is not. Games is um, focused on the broader uh, experiences sort of throughout North America. So she gets into the colonies, yes, but also places like the, the Southwest where the Spanish are, right? And, uh, and Florida as well. Very much kind of dealing with um, multiple places and perspectives. And so, um, so Games' work is really, really valuable um, because it's, it's actually kind of a broader perspective than, uh, than I think we tend to see in some of these history books, which oftentimes do focus, like Halls does, on sort of colonial New England, maybe moving down into kind of Virginia, but really that kind of um, east of the Mississippi uh, framework. And Games goes well beyond that. She very much kind of focuses on the big picture uh, North American folk or North American witchcraft and witchcraft belief. Um, throughout uh, the continent, really. 
um, games is uh, she's a professor of history at Georgetown University. Uh, that's uh, her credentials. This book uh, was written in 2010. So uh, again, this one is a little more recent. This is kind of right on par with uh, the Davies books as well, uh, written in the past 10 to 15 years. Um, and so the book is a little more uh, uh, relevant than uh, Hall's is in terms of its its research. And it can actually be a really good uh, book to use to sort of look at Hall's research and then update that a little bit as well. The, the games book and the Hall book kind of go hand in hand in kind of looking at some of the witchcraft beliefs um, throughout North America, particularly from really kind of looking at it from around the 1500s to around the 1700s. Um, that's that's kind of the era that both of them wind up focusing on. Games is, is just a much broader net uh, and covers a lot more ground. Um, hers uh, does address some of this sort of issues of folk magic uh, being practiced in different communities. For example, the Spanish encounter the indigenous communities down in the American Southwest uh, and sort of uh, the, the northern Mexican area, uh, California as well, um, and how that affects a lot of the sort of the dynamics there. So she gets into, for example, um, some of the ways that uh, there's a, a, a figure named Pope who leads a rebellion um, against basically the sort of Catholic um, Spanish overseers, um, and they very they accuse him of witchcraft uh, because of him practicing some of his indigenous beliefs that have then also been merged a little bit with some of the, the Spanish practices too. Um, and so she covers a lot of really interesting ground in her book um, about some of the different historical uh, events that are going on uh, and some of the different kind of ways that people have practiced these um, things. So her, uh, her book is particularly valuable uh, to sort of expand the geography of witchcraft in North America and understand it as a bigger phenomenon overall. And you get a bigger picture perspective on some of, uh, some of the witchcraft uh, accusations, as well as some of what I would say sort of the witchcraft practices, the sort of folk magic that might be going on um, in uh, various parts of North America during the, the sort of 200 or 250 years. Um, okay, so then moving beyond uh, the sort of just the history side of this, uh, there are a couple of other books that I would recommend. Um, if you're going to be looking at North American folklore and folk history and folk magic, um, what you're going to quickly find is that it starts to divide up by regions uh, relatively fast. So you wind up with um, a few different regions colonial New England, right? So this is sort of New England becomes its own thing. The Mid-Atlantic becomes its own thing. Um, the Upland South, the Deep South, the Southwest, um, the sort of uh, Middle West as well, um, the sort of Great Plains West, the uh, sort of California left coast area, things like that. Um, so all of that, um, you start to see that those regions develop their own specific takes on witchcraft, folk magic, um, belief, uh, supernatural belief systems and things like that. So one thing I think is really, really valuable is to be able to look at those regions in a little bit more depth. So one book I'm going to point you to, this is not, um, this is not a super happy, fun time, uh, relaxing read or anything like that. Um, it is essentially, um, essentially a textbook slash index slash guide uh, it's, it, to, to, to North American folklore. Um, and it's called American Regional Folklore. Um, it's a source book and research guide uh, put together by Terry Ann Mood. Uh, she is um, a professor at University of Colorado, um, and uh, basically what this is, is uh, looking at uh, folklore by the different regions in North America, and I'll go ahead and tell you some of the things that, uh, some of the different uh, regions that she breaks this down into. Uh, she gets you into kind of how to do the research more generally to start with, does a really broad overview of the United States, then starts breaking it into the Northeast, the South and Southern Highlands, the Midwest, the Southwest, the West, the Northwest, Alaska, and Hawaii. And she divides that uh, really specifically into those regions as um, as different ways to kind of look at the folklore of those places um, with the sort of understanding that each one of those divisions is going to have different experiences of folklore. Uh, so what does it mean to be a research guide and a source book? Well, it means that when you kind of break into it, it's uh, a lot of kind of indexed information. She gives you some brief introductions to uh, some of the sort of um, folklore of the area. So when you're, you know, you're getting into, for example, she has uh, the West. The West is kind of one whole section that she gives. She talks about the folklore of the West and she looks at, for example, um, the, the Cheyenne uh, indigenous tribes and kind of what their folklore is. Then she also is looking at, for example, the Mormon uh, folklore of the region, the Latter-day Saints uh, settlement of that region. 
um, and sort of what's the folklore surrounding that as well. Um, she gets into, you know, the sort of imagery of cowboys uh, sort of out there range riding on the West and sort of what's the folklore there. Um, and digs into collections that are going to be specific to that. So, for example, the Fife collection that's housed at um, uh, Utah State University, uh, I believe uh, she gets into to, to sort of what's in that collection. And, and she does give you a rundown of some of these different um, stories. She'll give you kind of a flyby of major figures in those in those stories and those tales um, and talk about, you know, for example, you know, Pecos Bill. Pecos Bill is... is uh, has some tall tales sort of being spread about him in this region. She'll give you kind of a summary of a couple of those, right? Um, but then what she does is she kind of leads you into some of the major folklore collections that are in each region. So you might look at, for example, uh, she has bibliographies for every single one of these. Uh, she gets into uh, Botkin Treasury. She talks about the Benjamin Botkin, uh, who's this folklorist who gathered a bunch of different treasuries. Uh, of folklore from different areas. Um, so she has the Botkin treasury of the Western folklore. Um, she has the, the Fife collection, which I mentioned earlier. She talks about some of the, the, the work that they did um, and really breaks it down into kind of folklore, legends, things like that, and says, you know, here's the books that you would want to go out and find. Um, here's some really, really interesting information. Um, she does talk about, you know, the different um, divisions of folklore. So, you know, jokes versus legends versus songs versus belief and superstition, which is going to be relevant to people who are interested in folklore uh, for, for magic and witchcraft as well. So uh, she does kind of all of that. And you can see, you know, right there, I don't know if you can see it, but the belief in ritual section right over here. Um, and she sort of, you know, gets into gets into some of the really specific examples that are there. there. The other nice thing she does, she'll talk about... Um, the specific museums or uh, foundations that are kind of in these different areas, uh, regional regional points of interest. So you learn about specific locations that are going to be valuable. And so, you know, she'll talk about some of these different museums. Uh, for example, if you're uh, over in um, California, uh, you might uh, go visit the uh, Casa Adobe de San Rafael if you're in Glendale, right? Uh, and so she'll give you the address and the contact information, the website and things like that as well. Um, just to kind of uh, orient you towards places where you can go. And that's one of the things I really like about this book is, yes, it gives you um, sort of a giant annotated bibliography of regional folklore throughout North America that you can really use to sort of drill down and find what you're looking for, uh, find better sources and information. But she also tries to get you to go to sort of some of the places and the, the people that are actually in these regions uh, rather than just reading about them um, secondhand so you can actually talk to you know, museum docents and things like that. Uh, she gives you contact information so you could learn about them um, by contacting them or viewing their collections online and learn a little bit more about uh, what they're doing. Uh, I will say one of the things to kind of think about this, this was written in 2004. Um, so the while it is a wonderful collection, it is absolutely valuable uh, to anybody who's doing folk magical research uh, or folklore research of any kind in North America. It does uh, have the limitation that it was written very close. It's getting close to 20 years ago at this point. Um, and when it was written was a very kind of the, the early days of uh, the Internet being used for a lot of these sorts of resources. The Internet information is um, probably a little dated. Uh, that's that's probably not as up to date as it could be. Some of these museums, sadly, are closed. You're going to find that there are some of these places that um, that sound fascinating that you're really interested in, in finding out more about and they don't exist anymore. So, uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, but as a, a jumping off point for doing a lot of good research on North American folk, uh, folk belief, folk magic and things like that, I highly recommend this. This is a very good, this is a very good resource for you. One other thing that I will recommend kind of in that regional folklore, uh, side of things um, is a book by Richard Dorson. Now, Richard Dorson was um, uh, the, he was a professor of folklore, uh, I believe Yale uh, is where, where he was located. Um, I should know this because uh, I'm sort of, my, my doctoral advisor was one of his students at one point, and I don't remember if he was at Harvard or Yale, or he may have been at both actually, um, at different points in his career. But, um, uh, but Richard Dorson uh, is kind of one of the big figures in early American uh, folklore uh, research, uh, particularly kind of in the academic world of folklore, uh, very much responsible for, for, for folklore becoming a major field um, of study in North America. So uh, he's, he's a valuable figure. He's very, very important, uh, and I highly recommend knowing about his work. Um, 
But that being said, this book was published. Uh, this book is called Buying the Wind, uh, and it's Ameri It's regional folklore in the United States. Buying the Wind, regional folklore in the United States. If you find it with a cover uh, on it, um, oftentimes it'll have like a sort of a picture of like uh, the wind kind of blowing at you. And Dorson uh, is really interesting, uh, or does a really good job here. His, this is, um, it is technically an academic book. It's very, very much sort of documented and footnoted. Um, lots of really specific information in here. Um, but uh, in doing this book, uh, which he did do, I believe this is written in the 1960s. Yes, 1964 is the publication date. So this is quite an old book. This is, uh, we're, we're heading into 50 years at this point with this book. Um, and uh, this is it's a very very valuable text but it's important to remember um, that the, any information contained within it is potentially going to be um, very dated at this point um, but that being the that being said it's also very very useful because um, it's a snapshot of a lot of these places uh, at the times when this information is being collected one of the things that's really really neat about um, this book uh, it's not just Dorson Dorson's doing sort of the editing and the collection of all this but he's actually compiling work from a lot of other folklorists throughout the United States uh, and including their research on these particular areas uh, of North America. And again, he um, he is also organizing this uh, by region. He's very much talking about these as sort of regional um, regional folk practices. So, for example, he has Maine Down Easters, uh, Pennsylvania Dutchmen, uh, Southern Mountaineers, Louisiana Cajuns, Illinois Egyptians, uh, the Southwest Mexicans, uh, and then, uh, I believe he has one more, and Utah Mormons. Those are the kind of divisions he has. Now, um, you can already hear in there, that's really particular in terms of a way to organize this book. Um, but at the same time, it does provide, it, it does provide a, a, a guiding sort of principle for how he's putting all this information together. Or everybody's looking at the folklore of Louisiana Cajuns, for example. Um, the folklore that's being sort of gathered there, uh, is... Uh, is very very specific to the the sort of Cajun people of Louisiana at the exclusion of other people who may be found in Louisiana as well but that means that there's a little more depth um, and you so you wind up being a lot more familiar with some of the lore of uh, of the Cajun people of Louisiana particularly around this time period this time period is going to be you know in the mid 20th century um, and Dorson kind of introduces it and then brings in, uh, like I said, other folklorists to sort of round out uh, the work. Um, uh, so, for example, there's something on nicknames in here uh, written by Elizabeth Brandon. Uh, so she, she writes a small section. <clears throat> so if somebody knows something uh, more than he does, uh, he's, he's willing to kind of include that information. Uh, he also is really, really good at uh, sourcing his information. So there's always footnotes. He always identifies where his sources are coming from. Um, he usually has the name of the person as well as the specific county or city that they're located in. Uh, so he's not just um, sort of spouting information without attribution, which is pretty wonderful stuff. Uh, that's, that's as an academic, I really like uh, having sources that I can sort of point to and verify and then go look at, you know, look at the records myself if I want to. Um, so it's really, really good uh, on that front. Um, the folk witchcraft side of it, it's important to remember, not every section is going to be talking about witchcraft and magic. Um, several do. The main section has some witch legends. Uh, for example, Mother Hicks, I think, winds up being one of the legends that we see up in Maine. Um, when he gets into Louisiana Cajuns, he talks about uh, hoodoo uh, as well. So that's, that's in there, Pennsylvania uh, Dutchman has a whole section on uh, Brakurai uh, powwow practices as well. Uh, so there are definitely folk magical components of this, um, and that makes it a very, very valuable piece of uh, research uh, information. Um, you can see, you know, I keep I, <laughs> I'm always updating it with uh, notes and, and uh, post-its and things like that because I'm always returning to it um, as a source to sort of help guide me to additional materials. So it's a very, very good book for, for that. Um, and I believe you can usually find it, um, if not uh, firsthand, secondhand, fairly cheaply. So it's not, not too bad. The last book I'm going to talk about, the last book I'm going to recommend today, is not quite um, in the same zone as the others. It is not um, a particularly historical book. Uh, it does have documented folklore, and I think it's very, very valuable for that reason. Um, it is exclusively focused on witchcraft, uh, and that is... Um, Hubert Davis's The Silver Bullet, uh, North American Witch Stories. Uh, the reason I want to highlight this collection um, is 
in sort of contrast to some of these other texts that we have that are much more sort of academic, this one is just stories. This one is just witchcraft stories. There's some commentary here and there um, where Davis will kind of jump in. Uh, I talk a little bit about the different um, stories that he's telling and sort of talk about the guiding principles kind of behind the, the way that he's organized these stories. But mostly he's leaving it to the stories. Now, what's also really interesting is that in uh, telling these stories, he does footnote them. So um, you don't have uh, very many stories that um, he, he includes without some kind of attribution. So, for example, he's got a story called The Lame Horse and the Lame Witch. Um, and then in the footnote there, he says this is based on a story told by Hal Jones, age 69, of Utica, New York, July 10th, 1948. So he is absolutely tracing the material here uh, and providing you with footnotes and indexes. Uh, to, to find more information. Mostly this does tend to focus on um, east of the Mississippi area uh, lore. I think there's one or two pieces that might stray a little bit west of the Mississippi, but most of this is going to be based in sort of the Mississippi, uh, or sort of the, the east of the Mississippi region. And a lot of it's really based in kind of the Appalachians as well. This book is old. It's uh, almost as old as Dorshan's book. It's 1975. So this one um, is something like 45, 46 years old at this point. Um, so, so quite old, um, but uh, still really, really good in terms of a good collection of stories. Um, I will say the kind of the other side of this is that Davis is not, he is a professional uh, academic, I believe. I think he taught either chemistry or mathematics. I can't remember exactly what he taught, but he taught outside of a field of folklore. That was not his primary field. Um, so what he, he really did with most of his kind of time was teach these uh these courses in his field which is definitely kind of a more science oriented field but his passion seems to have been doing folklore on the side so he uh did these kind of folklore collections he has another collection as well um which seems to be some of the same material that's in this book and some some that seems a little bit different but uh but this book is really really good now uh the the caveat i have to make with this book is that uh it is very very hard to find um it is out of print but it is a really really valuable book uh, in terms of the information it provides and sometimes you can find it on interlibrary loan and if you can do that it's absolutely absolutely worth getting this book making some notes um, and then putting it back into circulation if you can my own copy i've had it for years and years and years you can see uh, i'm going to try and be a little bit delicate with this but you can see it, it is literally coming apart at the seams uh, at this point because I have turned to it so much and I think it is such a good repository of witchcraft folklore and witchcraft information. Um, but, you know, uh, I have to treat it a little bit more delicately now because if once it comes apart, I'm really going to, I'm literally going to be kind of binding it up with duct tape at that point just to make sure I don't lose it. And so it's, it's a, an incredibly valuable book. You can sometimes find it secondhand. If you do find it secondhand, currently it seems to go for some pretty high prices. Um, I've seen anywhere from 50 up to $500. So it is not um, a cheap book to acquire. But again, there were enough copies printed and put on interlibrary loan that you can probably get one and look at it and get some notes from it, um, if nothing else. And every once in a while, you'll find one that goes secondhand and is, you know, 30 or $40 instead, uh, instead of 50 So sometimes that can, that can be a benefit for you. Uh, and the book itself does cover a ton of great witchcraft lore and information. Um, it covers uh, how to become a witch, how witches work, uh, talks about um, how to fight back against witchcraft, uh, what witches actually do, uh, witchcraft for money and mischief uh, is how he puts it. And he tells tons of great stories, uh, some of which really illustrate folk magic specifically, different types of folk magic that are being done in particular regions of, uh, of North America that he's focusing on. So if you can get a hold of it, I highly recommend that you do. It's been very informative to my work. It's been informative to others. I know um, Aaron Oberon, for example, who wrote Southern, uh, Southern Cunning, um, that was deeply influential to, to his work as well. So uh, again, you can already tell, this was, I think, seven books is kind of what I sort of did here. And this is already quite a long video. I don't want this to be, uh, you know, if I tried to, uh, to try to do every book I find valuable in doing folkloric research on North American folk magic and witchcraft, it would be uh, enormous. So I feel like breaking this into chunks and kind of letting you see, here are some of the different kind of things um, that you might want to focus on if you're looking for books on kind of history, um, the kind of colonial uh, uh, colonial era of, of North America. Uh, if you're looking at kind of sort of some o some overall guides to regional folklore and folk magic, um, hopefully this gives you some of those 
those books to start looking at and turning to. Um, uh, I will definitely be breaking into more specific regional uh, collections as well. Uh, like I said, uh, I'm kind of taking a both and approach to this uh, where I'm just going to kind of collect different books that I think are valuable for different reasons um, and present them, sort of talk about, um, you know, the relevance of these and, uh, and and what they might bring to your uh, research on folk magic and your sort of uh, ability to turn that into practice as well. So uh, hopefully this has been um, somewhat valuable to you. You might be able to um, find some of these books, go out, track them down, do some, some research with them, uh, and start kind of doing your own sort of work on North American folk magic as well. Uh, and I encourage you to go check these out. Like I said, many of these are, they're, they're walking that line between being academic and being publicly facing and publicly accessible. So um, they're, not, they're not light, breezy, easy reading necessarily, but they're not so um, academically dense and jargon filled that you're not going to be able to, to penetrate them in any way, right? You're gonna, these are going to be things that you can actually read and learn from um, and they're, I think, going to get you really excited about uh, doing more research and doing more reading um, and, and figuring out, you know, what's still practiced today? What do you, you know, what, what can you still work with um, that has existed here for maybe 100, 200, 300 years? Um, and you can still see examples of it kind of out there in the world uh, even today. Um, so, uh, again, highly recommend these books. I will be recommending more books. I'm hoping to eventually come back, talk a little bit about those 201 um, folk magic practical books, sort of ones that I think are good for you if, you're, um, if you've been doing the research and you want to start doing some more sort of practical stuff with them, uh, with the research you've been doing. Uh, I'll have some books that I think are, are useful for that. I'm going to be addressing some of these different sort of regional collections as well, digging into those a little bit more um, and giving you some other options that I think are valuable too. Um, hopefully this proves useful to you. Uh, and, uh, and if it did, please uh, share this around. Let other people know about this. I'm always excited to get people into folk magic uh, generally, and especially if they can do some good research. This hopefully gets, uh, gets them looking at some good sources as well. Um, if you do like this uh, video, please like this video. Uh, please you know, push that button, the subscribe button, push the bell button. Do all the fancy things that you know to do on YouTube or wherever you're seeing this um, so that other people can find this as well uh, and uh, maybe learn from this too. So uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, until next time, be well. <laughs>